Hey YouTube, welcome back to My Financial Focus. In this video, I'm going to be talking about how to make a discounted cash flow model. I've been getting a ton of requests from a bunch of viewers in the comments section in past videos asking me for this Excel sheet that I use to calculate the intrinsic value of businesses in the stock market to see what a good buying price would be for them from a value investing perspective. And so in this video, I'm just going to explain how we can build this model. There's a saying, obviously, feed a man with a fish or something, feed him for a day, teach him to fish, feed him for a lifetime. So I'm just going to make this quick little video here just to explain how to build this model and also just sort of explain what it is that we're trying to achieve with this model. So thanks in advance for leaving a like and let's get right into it. So the first thing that I just want to quickly review is what a DCF model is even trying to accomplish. Basically right here we can see it says the purpose of a DCF analysis is to estimate the money an investor would receive from an investment investment adjusted for the time value of money. And so basically what that means is a dollar today is worth more than a dollar received a year from now. We can see right here that it points it out and I made a quick little diagram here just to demonstrate what that actually means. So basically, if we received $1 today and we invested it and we got a 10% return on it in one year, then one year from now, that dollar would be worth $1.10. So basically, if we if we didn't receive that dollar today and received it like a year from now, we would miss out on this interest that we would have otherwise been able to collect had we received the dollar today as opposed to from a year from now and vice versa if we receive one dollar a year from now then the discounted i guess the discount rate at a 10 percent rate for that dollar would make it so that that dollar today is actually worth about like 90 90 cents basically 90 to 95 cents because 90 to 95 cents at a 10 percent rate that's going to give us a dollar a year from now and so a dollar today is worth more than a dollar a year from now and so what the model is basically trying to accomplish is right here we have the projected free cash flows of whatever business it is that we're trying to analyze and then we have the present value of those cash flows that we are discounting back from the expected future cash flows that the business is going to produce by our discount rate of 10%. And so really quick right here, we can see that this part of the model is pretty simple. Feel free to just copy this if, if that's just easier. I mean, if someone wants to, they can have all of these values like across the top right here and then just put like these values right underneath them. But for the sake of this video, I'm just going to show how to build it vertically because that's just the way that I like to do it. Right here, we can see we're going to want the growth rates for years 1 through 5 and years 6 through 10. Those are going to be the cash flows the business is going to produce in the first five years and the next five years after that. Obviously, with businesses that get bigger, their growth rates tend to slow down as they get larger. And so that's why I like to break this up into like little five-year segments because for the first five years their growth rate might be like 20 percent but for like the next five years after that it might decline to like 15 or 10 percent which is just something that naturally happens as businesses get bigger then right here we're going to want the discount rate that we're going to discount to the future cash flows back to to give us our present value of those future cash flows today i typically tend to use 10 percent but oftentimes what a lot of finance professionals will do is they'll use the weighted average cost of capital which is essentially just like a metric that shows what kind of rate of return investors are expecting for a particular business stock product anything really that is going to produce a return in the future but i typically just stick to using 10 percent because i personally want a 10% return on my money and so if I do this model using a 10% return and then come to find out the intrinsic value is not like if the intrinsic value of the business is like perceived to be less than what the current share price of the stock is based on this discount rate then I know that for my risk parameters 
for me wanting a 10% return that it's not going to be a worthwhile investment for me. And so I could just move on and look for something that will produce a 10% return and will be worth the investment if I buy into it at today's share price. Then right here we have the terminal value. This is basically something that we use just as like a hypothetical value. So if we were to own the entire business, which is typically how like Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger tend to analyze businesses is they just pretend that they own the entire business and then that's how they do their discounted cash flow analysis. If we own the entire business, then in year 10, we would essentially just be selling the business. And so we would sell it for whatever the free cash flow was in year 10. So if in year 10, say, the business produced like a million dollars, then we would sell it for 10 times a million dollars. So $10 million essentially. Then right here we have the year one free cash flow. This is just something that people get off of like a balance sheet or on some other website. If we just look up like in trading view or something, what is the cash flow of like, I don't know, Apple or Microsoft or something, it'll usually have the value right there and it'll just tell us like what their free cash flow was for 2020 or 2021, whenever it is that we're starting our analysis. And then that's the value that we'll plug in right here. You can see this is B equals six, which is this cell right here, B6. This is just the value that we'll use to start off our analysis. And we have the net cash minus net debt. This is just however much cash is already on the balance sheet or however much debt is on the balance sheet when we start our analysis. And so we're just going to use that to find the intrinsic value. After we find the present value, we add all of these values up. That gives us this value. And then we're just going to add however much cash is already on the business or subtract however much debt is on the business. And that gives us the intrinsic value. As we can see, this is B15, which is this cell right here, plus B7, which is this cell right here. And this is just something extra I put in just for my own personal preference stock ticker, but it's not really necessary for the actual model. And then we have shares outstanding, and we're just going to use this value to divide by the intrinsic value to give us the intrinsic value per share. Now for these metrics right here, these are the important ones. This is what determines the entire outcome of the model. And right here for free cash flow, we can see that as I said before, year one is just whatever is already on the balance sheet when we start our analysis. Year two, this is the equation right here. And basically what this equation is saying is it's basically D2. D2 is the year one free cash flow. And then we're just adding that to whatever the free cash flow is multiplied by the growth rate. And the growth rate right here, as we can see, is in cell B2. These dollar signs in Excel, they basically represent absolute values. And when I built this model, I basically just took this equation and I just dragged it down like this. And when I drag down an equation like this, what it does is it takes whatever equation is in the cell that I drag down and then it just changes the values depending on like how or far I, dro I dropped it down. So if it's D2 and then I drop it down, this turns into D3 and then this turns into D4, this turns into D5 and so on. It just continues to fall down because it's all in column D. So it's gonna remain as like D. But if I drag it down, then the numbers are going to change the farther I drag it down. But right here, as we can see, if I have these dollar signs, these change the values from relative values to absolute values. And so when I drag down this equation, even though these values will change like D3, D4, D10 and everything else, the actual B2 values won't change because I have those dollar signs in front of them and that makes it an absolute value. And so every single cell in this column or row is going to reference B2 for the first five years. And then for year six, let me see. Wait, actually I screwed it up. Let me see, let me go back. So we can see right here, I dragged down this equation for the first five years. And then because this is referencing Okay, I don't know what I just did. Uh, sorry about that. So I drag down the equation and then this is going to reference B2 because it's for growth rates years one through five. And then for growth rates years six or 10, it's referencing B3. So I just manually changed this value from B2 to B3 for years six through 10. 
And then for the terminal value, it's just whatever value was in D11 multiplied by B5, which is the terminal value right here in cell B5. And for the present value, this is the main equation of the discounted model. This is where we discount the cash flows back based on our discount rate. And this is the equation we're using right here. It's just a regular discounted cash flow formula. We can see it's basically just the cash flows for the year. So if it's cash flows for year one, then for this model in particular, those cash flows can be found in cell D2. Then we're dividing it by the discount rate, which is just one plus the discount rate. So in this case, it would be one plus B4, which is where my discount rate is right here, 10%. And then we're just putting that to the power of whatever year it is. So basically, if it's year one, then this is just going to be the present value of year one's free cash flow to the power of one, which isn't going to change anything. It's just one year from now, what is it discounted by at 10%? So if this is like 1.1 million or something, then this is going to be worth 1 million because we're just discounting it by 10%, right? And then for the next couple of years, you can see that we're discounting the model by a power of the next consecutive year. So in this case, we would discount it by 10% to the power of two. And the reason why we do that is because of compound interest. Remember, since we're discounting these cash flows by 10% every single year, obviously we see right here like if we have $1 today and it increases by 10% the next year, and we have like $1.10 that year, from that point on, if we get a 10% return on $1.10 into the future, it's not going to increase by 10 cents. It's going to increase by like 11 cents or 12 cents, right? And so it compounds that way. And so since when we get our return, our return is compounding into the future, when we discount them back, we also have to discount them by that exponential return. And so that's why we're basically just finding the discount rate to the power of the year. And that's just increasing with each consecutive year. So this is like the discount rate to the power of C3, which is right here. This is two years and then three years, four years, five years, and so on. We just continue to discount it to the power of whatever year it is. And then for this, it's exactly the same thing. We're just discounting the cash flows from the terminal value. So whatever this value is, that's just the value that we use here. So these equations are pretty much all the same. So then lastly, just to end it off, this is where I like to place my final valuations for the entire business after the calculations work out. The present value for the cash flows is just the sum of everything in the present value column. So it's E2 plus like everything added between E2 and E12. And that's represented by this equation right here. Just sum parentheses E2 colon E12 close parentheses. And then the intrinsic value in billions, like I said before, we're just adding whatever value is in here to however much cash or debt is on the balance sheet when we start our analysis. Right here, we're just dividing by how many shares outstanding there are. And the reason why it says if error here is because if I were to remove these values like this, and I just went like this, we can see this little error message would pop up. And the reason why it does that is because there are no values right now in B16 or B9. And so the equation doesn't have anything to work with. And so for Excel, it just produces like this kind of ugly error message. And I don't really like that. So what I like to do is just use this quick equation right here, if error. And this basically just makes it so that if there is some sort of an error message that pops up into any of the cells, then I can program it to basically produce this value right here that I have in quotation marks which says no values available. And so I just use that for each of these cells. It's not really necessary, but it just makes it look a little bit cleaner in my opinion. And then right here, we are basically just multiplying the intrinsic value per share by 70%. And that gives us our 30% margin of safety. And then we're multiplying 
this value by 50% and that gives us our 50% margin of safety. And that's demonstrated by these equations up here. And so once we have all that information, that basically just gives us the intrinsic value per share and the 30% and the 50% margin of safety so we could figure out what a good buying price would be into the future. And that's pretty much it. So just to sum up, a DCF model just helps us determine the value of an investment based on its future cash flows. And I know companies typically will use the weighted average cost of capital for their return, but I don't do that just because for the sake of like just the fundamentals of my videos, I don't go too much into detail. I might do that like in my own spare time, but for the sake of the videos, I typically use 10% just because I want a 10% return personally. And so if the business or the asset that I'm trying to value can't produce a 10% return and the intrinsic value just isn't to my liking, then it just won't be worth my time and my risk adversity personally. And then also obviously, there are a lot of limitations that come with this model because we have to correctly estimate the future cash flows of a business, which is pretty much impossible because the future cash flows of a business can be affected by a variety of factors like market demand, the status of the economy as a whole, technology, competition, as well as unforeseen threats and opportunities. We saw a lot of that in 2020. And so we can't like perfectly predict what the future cash flows of a business will be, but even though the DCF model isn't perfect, it's definitely a valuable tool that we can use to reference to get a better sense of a business's valuation. Like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff, and I'll see everyone in the next video.